Nuclear power is the only thing that can give the power density needed to make this viable. This isn't a new concept. In 1961, the Atomic Energy Commission and NASA launched the Nuclear Engine for Rocket Vehicle Applications program, or NERVA for short. This program developed and ground-tested 20 reactors before it was disbanded in 1973 due to budget constraints, but was recently revitalized when the US Congress approved $125 million in research funding for nuclear propulsion. There are two primary types of nuclear space propulsion, nuclear electric, which would power an ion drive like we saw above, and nuclear thermal, which was the focus of the NERVA program. So let's start there. Nuclear thermal propulsion works by harnessing the heat created during nuclear fission to provide the energy needed to expand and accelerate a propellant through an exhaust nozzle. Here, the nuclear reactors work in much the same way as a nuclear reactor here on Earth would, where a chain reaction of neutrons colliding with uranium atoms splits them and creates more neutrons and a tremendous amount of heat. To capture this heat, a propellant, typically liquid hydrogen, is pumped through the reactor core, which will cool the reactor core and pass the heat to the liquid hydrogen, which rapidly expands and accelerates out of the thruster nozzle at high speeds, typically around 8 kilometers per second, twice as fast as chemical combustion, and thus about twice the specific impulse, at around 887 seconds. However, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. Using hydrogen as a propellant comes with some issues. It can attack the fuel rods if they are not adequately protected with a material that is resistant to hydrogen's destructive tendencies. Liquid hydrogen also has to be stored at extremely low cryogenic temperatures. And if it is allowed to rise in temperature, it needs to be vented to prevent an explosion. And on top of this, the tiny molecule is so small, it can slip through seemingly solid materials as it can fit between the spaces of larger molecules. This makes it unsuitable for long storage periods and ideally we want a Mars transfer vehicle that can sit in orbit around the Earth or Mars for extended periods, waiting for the crew to arrive and begin its journey between the planets. Then when it arrives, the crew descends in a separate vehicle, leaving the transfer vehicle parked in orbit once again. Liquid hydrogen is just a pain to use in this application, so why use it? Because when it comes to maximizing exhaust velocities and thus specific impulse, low molecular weight exhaust products are important. Assume for a moment that all the heat energy we input into the system is converted to kinetic energy in the exhaust products. Kinetic energy equals a half times the mass times the velocity squared. To find the velocity, we can rearrange this equation. So now we see that velocity equals the square root of two times the energy divided by the mass. It's clear here that increasing the mass of the exhaust particles will decrease the velocity of our exhaust. Hydrogen is the lightest element and thus maximizes specific impulse. If we were to use another propellant, it would be extremely difficult to make a nuclear thermal propelled spacecraft with a high enough specific impulse to justify its use. The next lightest gas is helium, which is twice as heavy as hydrogen, and thus will reduce our specific impulse by the square root of two, nearly negating all the advantage nuclear thermal propulsion can provide. The next lightest element, which isn't a solid at temperatures we require, is nitrogen, which is 14 times heavier, and thus would decrease our specific impulse by the square root of 14, which is 3.7 times worse, making a nitrogen nuclear thermal engine worse than a traditional combustion engine. So we can't get away from this hydrogen storage problem. And if we hope to use nuclear thermal propulsion, we are going to need to figure out how to keep hydrogen cryogenically stored for extended periods. If this problem could be solved, the higher specific impulse and higher thrust could cut our transfer times to Mars by half or potentially open launch windows outside of the ideal home and transfer window. So, can we get around this hydrogen storage problem while using nuclear power to achieve higher specific impulses? This is where ion propulsion becomes really attractive again. One massive advantage in ion propulsion's favor 
is its ability to use heavier, inert and easily storable noble gases as propellants, like xenon or krypton. This goes against our previous understanding where low exhaust molecular masses are beneficial to higher exhaust velocities. This is possible because we are using electric power to launch these atoms at tremendous speeds. The ion exhaust velocity is defined by the charge of the ion, the voltage that it is being accelerated by and the mass of the ion. The charge and mass of the ion are defined by the propellant choice, but we can scale that voltage very high before we hit a limit in performance due to material properties or some other physical limit. For combustion or nuclear thermal engines, we are converting thermal power to kinetic energy. That thermal power is difficult to scale. Chemical combustion is limited by the energy we can liberate from the chemical bonds of the propellants and by the temperature our engine can operate at before it melts. This is a problem for nuclear thermal power too, which has to run extremely high reactor core temperatures of 2500 degrees Celsius to achieve exhaust velocities high enough to justify its use. Specialized nuclear fuel designs are needed to survive these temperatures and any higher would destroy the reactor. For reference, this is an order of magnitude higher than nuclear reactors here on Earth need to achieve, which typically operate at about 300 degrees Celsius, as they are in effect just boiling high pressure water. Ion thrusters do not come close to the operating temperatures that thermally driven engines do, and we can crank that voltage up high enough that the added mass of the ion barely matters. We are still achieving 10 times the specific impulse of traditional engines. Could we use a lighter propellant to increase specific impulse? Of course, but the advantages of using propellants like xenon and krypton are so good that the drop in exhaust velocity and specific impulse are worth it. Being inert, they can easily be stored over the long thrust cycles ion propulsion needs, making them the ideal propellant for long duration interplanetary missions. Larger atoms like xenon also hold on to the electrons in their electron cloud much looser than smaller atoms like hydrogen. So it takes less energy to ionize xenon than it takes to ionize hydrogen. So this reduces the electrical power needed for the first step in our ion propulsion process. And most critically, higher mass exhaust improves thrust. This equation defines the thrust an ion propulsion engine can generate. Where ion mass forms the denominator of our specific impulse equation, it forms the numerator for our thrust equation, meaning an increase in ion mass will increase our thrust, which is the spec that ion propulsion struggles with most. A worthy trade-off. For the nuclear thermal engine, the propellant acts as a coolant. For the nuclear electric engine, we will need a closed loop coolant system, where we do not expend the coolant, but keep it in a cycle between the hot engine and a heat exchanger. The only method we have to dump heat overboard in space is through radiative cooling. So a nuclear electric propelled spacecraft will need massive radiator fins where this coolant can pass through. This is feasible, but we have a long way to go with developing nuclear engines for space. And even with this added power, nuclear powered ion propulsion would still be on the low end of thrust. In all likelihood, these ion propelled engines will need to be a hybrid engine that can use chemical combustion for high thrust maneuvers, or if the problem of long term hydrogen storage can be addressed, a nuclear hybrid engine is extremely attractive, where our high thrust burns can be produced by the nuclear thermal engine, and then through neutron absorbing control mechanisms like these rotating drums, where one side is coated in a neutron reflector and the other is coated in a neutron absorber. By simply rotating these drums, the engine temperature could be lowered and switched to a closed loop coolant system that could power our electric generator and provide extremely high specific impulse and a gradual increase in velocity that could drastically cut our travel times to Mars or perhaps allow humans to venture even further into our solar system and begin our gradual exploration and settlement of our cosmic neighborhood. This is an incredibly complex topic with many nuanced and complicated ideas that I struggled to grasp until I found the right equations. 